Okay, uh, my name is Musharraf Khan, and I'm the coordinator of NYU Research Group on Transnational Everyday Life. Uh, today we have with us Professor Rupini Bhayanaya, who teaches in uh, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Delhi. Uh, Professor Naya delivered a lecture at NYU a couple of days back, and uh, where she spoke about her project on uh, everyday uh, emotion, emotional registers in everyday life uh, in Indian cities. And we thought we'll do a brief conversation with her uh, with more specific questions about her project and some of the things that she could not discuss in her talk. So, uh, welcome Professor Naya. Pleased to be, be here. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for agreeing to talk, uh, to, talk to us. Uh, our first question I thought I'll ask you is, could you please tell us briefly about your project uh, and how it connects to the idea of everyday life as such? Yes, my interest in everyday life goes back quite a long time because when I did my PhD long time ago, one of the most interesting aspects of my work was I was working on narrative and what happens when everyday life is uh, disrupted by a major disaster. So in my case, I was recording women's um, uh, accounts, mostly women, but also men as well, of when, what happens when a bar or a flood overtakes one's uh, life. That means one's life is, the everyday rhythms of one's life are terribly dislocated, and it's as if everything is wiped away and you have to retell your life in order to get back the sense of uh, get possession of your everyday life. So at that time I used certain tools which the ethnomethodologists had developed, you could say exploratory tools or research tools, and one, was, one of them was called conversational analysis. So conversation is part of everyday life like the one we are having now, that we live through our words. So what I did was to analyze the, the discourse of the women who had suffered these terrible disruptions. So that disaster and the everyday can come together through the practice of our speech. That to me was the first insight about everyday life and what it might mean in a very fundamental sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then now uh, uh, that interest has been revived because I thought in in my in the project that we are doing now, let me tell you yeah. a little we'll bit know a little bit more about that project, project yeah. which as I said has roots which spiral back mm -hmm. to to my doctoral work. Uh, this project is funded by the Department of Science and Technology, and it is a large-scale project. Science it's and Technology of Government of India. Of the Government of India, and it was a competitive grant, so a lot of energy, of my own energy, went into framing this proposal, which I was quite enthusiastic about. And um, the, so the project is called the LEC project, L-E-C, Language, Emotion, and Culture Project. So in this project, what we are trying to look at is how language and emotion grow together and work together in our everyday life uh, from the time we are children and babies. So a baby, for example, how does it learn to deal with the everyday life uh, around it? So we looked at... Um, um, the uh, growth of the emotions in babies and one of our, again, one of our methodological problems is how does one explore the context of everyday life and especially since you can't go and ask a baby right. what do you feel, what is your day-to-day -day emotional life like, what is your moment-to-moment, -moment, uh, the momentariness of our uh, emotional life and our linguistic life because babies in you know the word infant means without speech oh, so you cannot actually interview uh, um, 
a baby. And so we were thinking of how earlier, uh, and if the most um, in sort of um, everyday way of exploring this everyday problem of everyday life is to um, have a recorder and the researcher watches the baby okay. um, in its everyday activities, either in a lab or gives the baby experimental tasks. But we felt that this task was kind of isolating and objectifying the baby. And everyday life is not objective. Right. It is subjective, it's, an, it's, it's an everyday immersion, right. and it is subjective. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to know what we could do in, in, in order to, make, you know, to get rid of this bias which is at the heart of the cognitive sciences. Mm -hmm. And this is an interdisciplinary endeavor, so we had to involve um, a side. We, we wanted, not that we had to, but we wanted to involve psychologists, philosophers, uh, literary theorists, and all of them to understand the concept of emotion. And so with the babies, we thought that what we would do is to ask the mothers, you know, how, whether they, how they remembered everyday life. And actually, I also wanted to first find out whether mothers could um, understand, uh, you know, they could recognize emotions and interpret them and name them linguistically okay. in everyday life. And we, this must be one of the largest studies ever done because we've done 500 mothers and we looked at earlier studies and there's nothing of this complexity and of this degree of involvement. And we, did, we studied 24 emotions, whereas earlier the basic emotions were um, studied were about six or seven or eight or nine, but never 24. And we felt that we should have a spectrum so that we could see what mothers and fathers were good at recognizing. Well, we did 100 females and 100 males, uh, no, sorry, uh, 500 females and 500 males, which is a 1,000 people. And it was very, very exciting to find that almost Everybody is very good in everyday terms at recognizing a whole range of emotions. And this, these emotions... You mean recognizing in babies uh, or... Or recognizing in across, general. In general. Across. Okay. So this meant that if you can recognize it in everyday life, mm -hmm. in, in the, on the faces of strangers, okay. our hypothesis was you could possibly also recognize it in the intimate, introspective, context of dealing with your baby. Right. right? Okay. So that was our hypothesis. And another hypothesis was that language and emotion would have to grow in tandem. Because I don't know if you know, but our everyday life cons consists, or we conceptualize our everyday life as involving all our senses, mm -hmm. our vision, touch, um, feeling, you know, all kinds of feelings, taste, and so on. But most of these sensory perceptions um, develop quite early on, within the first year of life. But language develops over four years. So it takes a long time. And it's the defining human trait. So we were interested in knowing whether there was a long span for the development of emotions and whether emotions like, let's say, shame or hope develop later than, let's say, um, you know, fear or anger. And we wanted to see whether there was a developmental trajectory. So once we had established that people were very good in everyday life at recognizing each other's day-to-day facial expressions, body language, and so on. The next thing was to ask mothers, do you recall when you saw this emotion in your child? How do you contextualize it? And this is memory. So relying on memory, which as you know, Freud said in the psychopathology of everyday life, is tremendously um, unreliable. So we weren't sure. But when we did our studies, what we found is each of our 500 mothers recognizing happiness first, then sadness, then laughter, then anger, then fear, then disgust. So it was like a, 
I mean, almost you could say uh, a, 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 a revelation that mothers remembered uh, so accurately. Of course, this, the ages at which they remembered this differed to some extent, but by and large, it didn't differ, and there was a wonderful kind of um, um, uh, coherence of recall among these mothers. So we found that the everyday life of mothers is every mother and child is intimately connected, is different and individual. And, but at the same time, if you look at memory as a resource, which only mothers have and the observer, doesn't have, right. then what you have is uh, you can see that there's also something common. And this is what connects to Darwin. Because Darwin had written this little known book after he had become very famous for the theory of evolution, and it was called The Expression of the Emotions in uh, Man and Animals. And that 1872 book is the foundation of many studies in affective science. Now, there are many things so-called wrong with Darwin's studies, but the fact that he wanted to study the emotional life of people across cultures, that he sent this questionnaire to so many countries, including India, and uh, where the Calcutta Bengali is specially mentioned. That's These things yeah. excited us, you know, and so we, we tried to begin with an understanding of Darwin, but also um, uh, took it, um, uh, you know, took it in a different direction because we felt culture, we would, you know, uh, to, uh, situating this large scale study in India was a very important factor and we didn't want to universalize enough universalize everyday life or homogenize it. We wanted to locate it within culture and within intimacy, within the individual relationship between a mother and a child, between people. But also we wanted that there was something which enables you and me to talk across cultures. When I say you and me, of course, not necessarily you and me, but people to talk across cultures. Right. So I'd like to interject here and maybe just tease out something from this. What is the significance of studying uh, emotional registers in everyday life? Yeah. Uh, why is this project so important? Maybe it can tie to tie into something that you said just now that we can communicate across cultures, mm -hmm. across regions in India for that matter, mm -hmm. if you're situating it mm -hmm. in Indian context. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know why is it so important and why would the Department of Science and Technology would grant you a huge amount of money to conduct this particular project at this point in time? Well, I think it's not the huge amount of money, but the huge amount of enthusiasm <laughs> which went into this project. But let's say uh, we w w won. I mean, uh, since in 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 the West, since Descartes, you know, there has been an un understanding of the mind as a rational place, as where you process thoughts, where emotions were factored out as belonging to a kind of a region which didn't involve rationality. Now, slowly, uh, it has been recognized in neuroscience, in the work of Damasio, Ledoux, you know, lots of people, that we actually have neurons in the gut, so, you know, that uh, we react emotionally, and uh, that this influences our rational perceptions. So it, you know, even interest um, and deception for example, that you may be bored, but but you're interviewing me, so you can't afford to be <laughs> to look Precisely, bored. Yeah. So you can pretend to look interested. So these questions of du duplicity, deception, of which have practical consequences, but also the idea that we cannot process thought, mm -hmm. we cannot be human mm -hmm. uh, without an emotional life, is very fundamental to our self-understanding and to our cultural understanding. So many disciplines. 
ask the question, what does it mean to be human? across disciplines. So psychology asks this question uh, in one way, talking about the inner self and the mind. History uh, uh, looks at human action across time. Um, you, you know, literature looks at uh, the whole uh, understanding of um, nuance in in emotional life. So there's no discipline which kind of, even physics talks of the, about the observer's paradox. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if it's impossible to exclude the interested human day-to-day um, -day self from our understanding of the question broad question across the humanities, the social sciences, and the cognitive sciences in which I'm interested in. But I don't want to only understand the cognitive sciences in, in terms of a distant observer uninvolved, but of how we resolve the paradoxes of everyday life, uh, the tactics of everyday life in the words of Deserto, the strategies, the places, uh, all these things have to be processed online, moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, it's, it's critical to science today, to cognition today, to uh, understand, uh, you know, this abstract, you can't hold it, you can't, but you can. Since we don't have much time, I thought we'd move to the next question. And we briefly discussed about your interest in uh, the concept of desire as an everyday emotion. And you really didn't get to speak about it in your talk. Uh, no. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that. How do you, you know, bring to bear the concept of desire in your study of everyday emotions? What does desire really do as an everyday emotion? Yes, desire is a motivating emotion. You know it. And just to yes. interject, uh, also I'd like to know: is it the desire in terms of? desire for things, material desire, or is it sensual desire? Which one you're actually interested in? There are in? many kinds of desire, yeah. sensual desire, virtual desire, bod uh, which is the bodily desire. So let me say why I think desire is so important. It relates to precisely the point you made today about consumerist desires, which, as you know, proliferate today. And we I had suggested long time ago when I wrote Technobrand that um, you know we needed a new discipline for the 21st century, and that new discipline I called or I named epithymetics, and this is a Greek word which you'll find in the dictionary, but it is not used. And I suggested that we should bring it center stage. What does that mean? And let me tell you. So the traditional dis disciplines of philosophy include ethics mm -hmm. and aesthetics, and epithymetic. Epi means upon, and Timos means the soul. So upon the soul, desires are written upon the soul. And this I understand in a broad contextual way as related to the problem of the emotions. How do we decipher, how do we make legible the writing on the soul, you know, which is written on the soul? So I thought that if we uh, create this disciplinary space, among the various disciplines, we could then bring together historical understandings of desire, psychological understandings, most importantly, literary and performative understandings of, this, of what we want, what is written upon the soul. So this is my project. And I also wanted to say again that India is one of the best places in which to locate the study of desire. And why is this so? Because we have a long tradition. Oh, the Buddhists talked about Trishna. Trishna as thirst, as desire, as you know, this longing, this craving you have, and how you might deal with it. So it was recognized as a central conundrum about how we deal with thirst and the, the thirst for so many things. And then, then we have the Kama Sutra, 
which is you know the great text detailing the structures of social desire and individual desire and right up to Bollywood dreams of desire through many texts. So I thought that, you know, and we have Bharat there who talks about the performative uh, aspects of Sringara. So there's a whole Sanskrit tradition, but also the tradition which the Mughals brought to us. So there are many literary and cultural understandings of which make desire central to a central trope in understanding, um, again, the question of who we are. But also, I thought that today, if we study desire, there is, a, you know, if you look at Marx and he talks about commodity fetishism, he says human feelings are transformed, put through the mill of the industrial process, and you turn human feelings into commodities which you then desire. And I thought that Marx was very prophetic in this understanding, but then he was also thought in terms of the perfectibility of man, and he thought, okay, you know, let's think about each according to his, to each according to his needs. But I think to each according to his needs and desires, desire in particular. Especially, as you point out, in India, there is a long tradition of writing on desire, conceptualizing and theorizing desire. But at the same time, as I understand, also in India, there is a long tradition of negating desire, any kind of bodily desire, mm -hmm. right, in Hindu philosophy especially. Right? So there has been a kind of negation that everything is, is in vulgar sort of Indian philosophy, everything is maya, which should mm. be got rid of. Uh, yes, that's true. And at the heart of epics like the Ramayan, there's, you know, Sita desiring the golden deer, which is Maya illusion, mm -hmm. is actually the story of desire. So you're very right. But I think every tradition, including the Indian, which deals with desire, also seeks, uh, uh, feels that it should be something which is to be controlled. Precisely. The appetites, yeah. the passions, yeah. and this is true. Right. You know, we were talking about Descartes earlier, that the appetites and hungers of the mind and the body are something that are troubling. And why? My, uh, you know, we were talking about consumerist desires. We want so many things off the supermarket shelves and so on. So uh, uh, consumerism means to consume, to eat, and it eats you up. Right. Desire eats you up from within, yeah. and that is quite uh, cr crucial yeah. to, um, to, to not be eaten up by this monster. And that's the fear, yeah. that it's right. an internal yeah. monster that eats yeah. you up. Yeah. So I think in that sense... That's uh, very interesting what you pointed out, because yeah. that's the way I was kind of going to ask you again. That So it looks like desire is something that's disruptive of the everyday in some senses. Mm. Uh, that the normal order of the everyday could be disrupted through desire, by excessive desire in some mm. ways. But again, in the consumerist culture of 21st century, without desire there is no consumerism in a way. That you have to desire an iPhone or something so that this consumerist culture can continue in a way. Because the day we eliminate desire, there's no consumerist culture as such because it survives on the very notion of desire, in creating those desires. Yeah. Okay. But again, uh, mm. excessive desire is dangerous for the everyday. It has to be controlled so mm. that we can continue with our everyday. You know, it's not only that desires are present and you want to satisfy them. It is that the whole meaning of consumerism is that desires are created. So Bharat said mass culture is a machine for producing desire. Uh, but at the same time, you have somebody like Judith Butler who has written on this subjects of desire and Hegelian desire, who says that, um, you know, um, uh, desire is the blind spot of speech. So uh, that means that there is something beyond speech. That And speech is the everyday, you know, for me as a linguist, for me as somebody immersed in literary text, speech is the everyday. And desire can be so, uh, so consuming that it even, uh, blinds you to uh, your every, the everyday nature of your speech. So desire is both that, it, that which gives meaning to your life, 
because you want it mm -hmm. and it is something which you uh, which you can but, disrupt but well. the excess I think this question of the excess of desire is quite important because you know uh, it, it, why should desires be excessive? You can ask yourself, why is a desire excessive? And uh, that notion is a very culturally controlled notion Precisely, of yes. what is yeah. excess. Yeah. And very so, contextual. Yeah, and f it's linked to a, much, a very fundamental notion. That notion is the notion of freedom. So moksha is freedom from desire, and freedom itself is as fundamental a notion as as desire itself so so you have a uh, so in the discipline of epithymetics which i'm suggesting you have contestatory notions and i would actually argue that contestation is part of everyday life it's not actually something which disrupts everyday life but everyday life is uh, like walking is a series of falls and that's how a biologist would describe it. Desire is a series of little falls in everyday life. And if you see life like that, maybe you have in my, um, my disaster narratives, which I mentioned earlier, you have huge disruptions of everyday life, which are not to do with desire, but even there, they are to do with desire in the sense that you want to recapture that which you lost, which you have lost. So loss is also a central concept. So we have freedom, we have loss, we have recognition, self-recognition. The so desire captures this tension. And you know, there is no everyday life without tension. Precisely. That, that is, that's what everyday life is. Yeah, sort of. yeah, everyday yeah. life is about tension. And so, you know, is this time running out? Is this interview going to end? What do I do after this? So freedom, desire, these are the ghosts which haunt us in our everyday life. Spectres, as what's his name would say, Derrida. Yeah. So uh, I think that we'll try to wrap it up now because you have to go and we don't have much time. And I was just thinking if you could very briefly uh, tell us about your approach because in this series we are trying to understand the different approaches that scholars take to study the everyday. Uh, what is your approach? Because you're working at the intersections of literature, psychology, cognitive sciences. Uh, I think what we are doing now is to uh, uh, adopt an approach which we said is multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. We are trying to uh, sort of look at uh, something like the everyday from the point of view of uh, the fundamental knowledge that we are trapped, we are in our bodies. This is our habitation. So uh, I would say that one of the fundamental notions is embodiment and I would like to look and with our studies with children and emotional growth. We have looked and Darwin looked at embodiment as critical to an understanding of the emotions. The emotions don't happen in some um, you know, a rarefied Cartesian space, they have, or in a linguistic space, they happen in an embodied space. So one central concept for me would be embodiment, and the other one would be, so to understand it as a physical, material, lived thing, that is one way of understanding the everyday, that there is no escape, you know, you can't have a concept of the everyday, which is totally, uh, decontextualized and it would be very interesting to frame a series of questions about de you know can you have a decontextualized understanding of the everyday and because of the importance of context and the importance of the body that's one thing and for me as I said because I'm a co you know I'm cognition uh, I'm interested in cognition another route would be language itself and it's being inside the text inside our memories so language is my infinity machine it's my way of understanding what it means to have apprehensions of in, uh, you know, of uh, something beyond ourselves in the everyday. So inside the everyday, strangeness is enigma. Is you know, where do these notions come from? 
they come from our lived experience. Uh, so we can imagine the everyday without having read a book. But if we read a book, we can extend our concepts of the everyday all over the place, across the globe. So, you know, this whole imaginative and creative space is claimed through language and the body. So for me, I want to claim that space through this disciplinary knot, which would tie and untie. So that's my idea of, my approach would be, take two or three central concepts, um, which could include concepts from you know, in F Maya, like Maya, or in Moksha, but could also include central things like the body and language, and use them to understand the textures and the nuances of everyday life from the infants without speech growing to understand what it means to hold on to the emotions, what it means to reject the emotions, what it means to be fully human. Right, that's very yeah. interesting. Uh, I won't ask you any more questions, but what struck me about your, you know, finally when you ended on this note of language and body, that language as an unstable signifier, I, mm. by that I think you're already hinting that there's no getting to the everyday actually, it's always unstable. Mm. Sort of, there's an undecidability about the everyday itself, which yeah. is very difficult to actually get to ever. Because if you're trying to get to it through language, it's never going to be. It's, it's it, not you, you can't get to anything because, you right. know, I've always said that our lives are like a television play that you go, you lurch from episode to episode. They are not like a Greek tragedy where you know the ending because you never live through your own death. Right. So your death is not an event in your everyday life. But in a Greek tragedy or through a literary great text, a Greek tragedy or an Indian text, you understand death. But your everyday life is lurching, is always online. Is always virtual. Is always both virtual and embodied. It's always online. So in that sense, there's no getting to anything. But nevertheless, you know, we understand the sense of an ultimate destination. So through the everyday, so everything is located in something very normal and pain. I think so. So other kinds of things are also aspects of the everyday. So. Thank you for talking to us. And finally, I just was thinking, what do you feel theorizing everyday life in a city where this earth was theorized every day quite some time back? Uh, how does it <laughs> feel to be back to New York City and talk about the everyday? Well, I, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. That, you know, is the everyday life suddenly transformed by our experience of New York? And would everyday life be different in Delhi? And I think that. Um, you know, there is this strange decentering which happens when you travel, um, uh, you know, 10,000 miles and then you come to a city and you give a lecture and so on and so on. But I'm wondering whether this decentering doesn't also happen um, in, you know, in all contexts. That, you know, supposing I was not in New York or I didn't know that this was New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, would I, um, you know, have a different uh, kind of experience? You're Looked saying at yeah. New York from a huge Water height, center. saw yeah. the people mm -hmm. wa walking below and said, you know, that's one kind of life and uh, I can see the walking trails, I can see the uncertainties, I can see the, the gaps, the tactics and so on and so forth. But I think that that sense is very much textually produced on the page by De Serto. You know, and you look at the short chapters of uh, the practice of everyday life, and you realize that, you know, there are, there are these little um, uh, walkways which are created within the text, and very much a flaneur inside that text. So I think that in some ways, it, it, it's not location but it's dislocation which becomes central in, you know, in our, um, which is central to our processing of everyday life. Thank you so much for talking to us and 
uh, this is one one more interview in the series on everyday life uh, which we have named everyday conversations and we are hoping to continue this series thank you very much you should call them extraordinary conversations <laughs>